This lesson will be about experiments. So before we do anything else, um, I'm going to define what an experiment actually is. And we're going to have two types of studies in this chapter. The two types that we're going to have are going to be an experiment and an observational study. So an experiment is going to occur when you have a group of researchers and they have a group of subjects and the researchers will actively impose treatments on the subjects. And um, after they impose the treatments, um, they are then going to measure how these individuals respond. So um, that's the first type of study that we have. The second type of study is called an observational study. And an observational study is going to occur when the researchers that you have are passively observing individuals. They do not impose any sort of treatment. And by treatments, it could be several things. It can be medicine. It can be having one group exercise and one group not exercise. It could be giving them a certain thing to eat. It can be having them read a passage and having one group not read a passage. There's a lot of different things that you can have for treatments, and you'll see some examples. Um, the second type of thing is what we call an observational study. So an observational study is going to occur when you have researchers who um, passively observe their individuals or their subject. And they also are going to measure variables. So an example you might see of this, you might see things that say something like, studies show that people who smoke um, tend to be more susceptible to heart disease. So this does not actually have any researchers forcing people to smoke. Usually they, they ask people about their lifestyle habits and then they, um, they check to see if they have heart disease. So that would be an observational study. And one thing that's very important, and it's gonna be the case for this and the rest of the class, that really in this class, the only way we can establish a cause and effect, effect relationship is by looking at experiments. So you might remember from the last chapter that we said if there was a high correlation, that didn't necessarily mean um, that there was a cause and effect relationship. And so the only time we can look at a cause and effect relationship is if we look at a controlled experiment. So the next uh, term I'm going to talk about is it's a little bit confusing, especially when you first see it. So I'll give you the definition, and then we'll probably talk about a few examples of this in class. And this is called confounding. So we actually will have what's called a confounding variable. So I'm actually going to add that in here. And a confounding variable is going to be an extra variable that affects a study and so that the results that you get are not the actual, they're not, they don't reflect the actual results the way that they would be. So I'll write this down. And um, this usually isn't something that comes with really, really good experiments. Um, it's usually going to be something that occurs because of poor experimental design. And we'll talk about good experimental design later on. Okay, so for this, if you don't understand this yet, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll discuss it. It's not going to be extremely important. 
it's going to be more important that you can recognize a confounding variable, but we'll talk about that later. So um, our next, our next uh, term is the experimental units, and this is going to be the individuals that you're actually doing an experiment on. And, um, oops, so if these individuals are humans, that, then we call them subjects. So we'll have a few examples later on where they're not human. And our last word um, here, I'm, and I'm actually going to add an, another one in after this. Um, the last thing that we have is the response which you might also hear called the response variable. And you've heard that in the last section, I believe. So the response or the response variable is just going to be what the researchers are measure, measuring. Um, there's one other subject, or there's one other uh, vocab word I'd like to add, and that's treatments, because this is important. So a treatment, you might have figured this out based on um, when I was talking about experiment. A treatment is a condition you apply to the experimental units. And... Um, I think I mentioned a few earlier on, for example, giving, giving people medicine um, or telling them to exercise. Those are, those are going to be treatments. And we'll do a few examples where you actually do have to identify them. So here's our first example. And in this example, um, go ahead and take, take a look at it, read through it. You can pause if you need to. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to identify experimental units explanatory and response variables, and treatments. So experimental units are going to be the individuals that we are studying. This one is a really tricky one because they talk about 812 people um, in 376 households, but actually what they tell you next is that they assigned 185 households to um, this medicine called ivermectin. And so Actually, in this case, my experimental units are going to be households. They are not the people. This one, I deliberately gave you a tricky one in the beginning, just so that you could see that sometimes it's not always going to be humans, or it can be like something like a household. The, um, the next thing that we have to do is figure out our explanatory variable, and... When we're working with experiments, the explanatory variable is generally going to be the treatments that they receive. So that's pretty much going to be the case for most of these. The explanatory variable will be the treatments. And so the explanatory variable here is going to be the type of medicine. So that's what the experimenters do, but in this case, it's the explanatory variable. And this is going to affect or at least the experimenters hope that this affects the response variable. And the response, in this case a response variable, is going to be whether or not the household has head lice. So that's the thing that they measure in the end. The last thing I asked you to identify is the treatments so my treatments, in this case, thankfully, there are only two. There's going to be a few examples where they're a little bit more complicated. So the treatments here are either going to be the ivermectin or the malathion. So there's going to be two here. Okay, so go ahead, um, you can pause if you need to, read through the example. So the first thing that they, I asked you to do here is the experimental units or subjects. In this case, the experimental units is going to be, um, as with anything, it's who we're experimenting on. 
By the way, this one and the first one were both experiments. And in this case, we're experimenting on the tomato plants. If you want to be more specific, you can even say 24 tomato plants. That, that's always nice if you do that. As in the previous one, you could have said 376 households. Um, the, the next thing is our, we're looking for the explanatory variable. And this one, there's actually two. And you're welcome to pause and see if you can figure out what the two are. So our two explanatory variables are going to be um, the amount of water and also whether or not fertilizer is applied. And you may um, notice that the amount of water is actually going to be a quantitative variable. Whether or not fertilizer is applied is going to be categorical. That's fine. That happens sometimes with um, experiments. In this case, um, the response, uh, once again, it's actually going to be, this is a quantitative. In the previous example, the response was uh, categorical. It was a whether or not. So the response variable, it says he will record the total weight of the tomatoes produced. That's our response here. It's going to be the total weight. Okay, the last thing I asked you to do was to identify the treatments. In this case, there are six of them. If you feel like you, you understand what they are, you're welcome to uh, pause and try to identify them. So in this case, I'm gonna actually draw a little diagram off on the side. You don't need to draw this, um, especially if you run out of room, but I'm gonna kind of draw a diagram of what, what this experiment is doing. So it starts off and they have 24 plants. What they did was they took these plants and they, um, we're gonna assume that they, uh, actually they tell you it's gonna be half of them are going to get fertilizer and half of them get no fertilizer. From there, the ones that have the fertilizer, you're gonna have some that have 0.5 gallons, you're gonna have some that have one gallon of um, water, and you're gonna have some that have 1.5 gallon of water. And um, since there were 24, we're kind of making the assumption that there were 12 with fertilizer and three, or excuse me, there were uh, four each of these three. We're, we're assuming that they don't specifically say that. They say that eight of them got one, um, got each type of gallon of water, but we can assume that each was each of these groups had four. Um, the next thing is with our no fertilizer, we also had 0.5 gallons, we had one gallon, and we had 1.5 gallons. And again, um, as with the previous thing, we're going to make the assumption that um, that each of these little groups had uh, four plants in them. So my treatments, there are six. My first treatment is going to be the fertilizer. I'm just gonna write it, abbreviate it with an F and 0.5 gallons. My second treatment is going to be having fertilizer and one gallon. Third is gonna be fertilizer and one and a half gallons. I also have no fertilizer and 0.5 gallons. And the same, um, the same exact type of thing. So no fertilizer and one gallon and then no fertilizer and 1.5 gallons. So those are my, we call them treatment groups. So another vocab term I'm gonna bring up, you might've heard this before, but it is a control group. So a control group is gonna be a treatment group that actually they generally have no treatment. And you might've, heard this, that oftentimes they sometimes will get a placebo. A placebo is going to be a pill that actually looks like a, a regular medicine, but it doesn't have any effect. Sometimes it's just a sugar pill. So oftentimes that's what the control group receives. You'll notice in, um, if you look back at example number one, where we had the head lice medicines, there were actually two groups that had different medicines. If the experimenters had really wanted to get, um, to have a good experiment, they actually probably should have, um, they probably should have gotten a third group and assigned that group to not take any medicine at all. 
So that would have been a, an effective way for them to make that experiment a little bit better. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the principles of experimental design. You might remember earlier on I mentioned confounding variables. And you use these experimental design principles in order to reduce confounding variables. So um, the first thing is comparison. When we're doing an experiment, it's always good to uh, have at least one treat, have at least two treatments so that you can compare them. Otherwise, it will not actually even be an experiment. So you compare two or more treatments. And um, the next one is the is control. Control is always a little bit confusing for people, especially because. It, it's not the same thing as a control group. So control, what this means is that we try to control other variables. For example, um, if you have a group of people taking heart attack medic medication or something and you have males and females, it's a good idea to have sa the same number of males and females in each group. You don't want a, a group of mostly women and another group of mostly men because they might have different characteristics. So we try to control other variables. And in that case, uh, gender would actually be an example of what we call a confounding variable. So it's important that we try to make all variables the same for all groups. It's, it's impossible to make things perfect, but you have to do the best that you can if you're creating an experiment. So like I was saying with the men and women, it would be a good idea to have the same number of men and women in each group. And um, the third thing is random assignment. So if you are running an experiment, it's important to randomly assign your experimental units to each group. So like if you, um, once again, with the heart attack medicine, if you let a doctor decide who gets to be in which group, they might assign the patients that are worse off to take the medicine and the ones that are a little bit less bad to take the placebo. You don't want to do that. That's not going to give you an effective, res effective results. So it's better to do random assignment. And um, replication, the important thing with that is to have many experimental units. So use enough experimental units. And in, um, for example, in the, the tomato example, they had a total of 24 plants. If they had just like one or two plants, that wouldn't have been a good experiment. Actually, the head lice one was even better with replication because they, um, they had over 300 experimental units, which were the households. So go ahead and... Pause, please, and read through this experiment. What you're going to be doing here is you want to dis discuss how each of the four principles of experimental design was used. The first one is comparison. And this, these researchers did effectively use comparison. They, uh, they divided the students into groups, and they compared them. So that's, that's all you need to mention for that. So um, the next one is control. And remember I said control was one of the more confusing ones. So there were a few variables that they controlled here. The first thing is that all participants were in the same exact lecture. So if they had gone to different lectures at different times of day, um, then they might have they might have gotten different results. That might have affected the the outcome. So that, that's one thing that causes them to control it. So that's the first one. The other thing um, is that they were all from the same university. And the last thing, um, which is really important if you're evaluating people, is that they gave the same test at the end. So these are good... These are good examples of how they can control the experiments. The third uh, principle is random assignment. 
And if you read through it, they, it says the, the researchers printed out 40 papers. They shuffled them. They handed them out to random students in the classroom. That is a great example of random assignments. Not only did the, the um, researchers not choose it, but they didn't even know who they were giving it to. And um, we're going to assume, actually, the students didn't even realize what they were getting or what how they were different from others. So um, all I'm going to say for that one is the researchers gave the papers out at random. Um, the last thing is replication. And a lot of people think replication means that you should do an experiment multiple times, which is definitely true. That's important. That's one example of replication. But another example of replication is just that you have multiple experimental units. So in this case, there were 20 students in each group. They might want to do this experiment again and get more, but they did do a pretty decent job with replication the first time around. Please pause and read through this experiment and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna describe a randomized design for this experiment and write a few sentences about it. What I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna do two things and this might help you out with this. I actually like to always write, make a, a visual diagram of experiments. So I'm gonna just split this in half and on one side I'm gonna make a diagram. And so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm just going to write what I'm what the experimenters are doing. So I started they started off with 60 children. And then they randomly assigned them and they put them into three different groups. So their first group was of 20 children. And that was the fast paced program. The second group was also 20 children. And that was the, the slow paced. So our third group is interesting. You might wonder why they were talking about um, television and they had these kids draw. This actually is an example of a control group. So you might want to mention that. Um, so once what they did was they, they assigned each of these in different groups. After they assigned these groups, then they did a comparison. They compared mental ability and impulse control. So um, this is a good visual just to help you organize things if you, if you get experiments like this. If you're really good at organizing things in your head, you don't need to draw this. If it helps you out, you can. So they ask you to decide to describe a completely randomized design for this experiment. And it is actually important when you describe an experiment to talk about how you're going to randomize them. So uh, there's a few ways that you can randomly assign them into groups. You can number each child, use a calculator to, to randomly assign them to groups. I actually am going to say, um, so I'm going to mix uh, papers and a hat, label each of the papers one, two, and three, and then each, each kid is going to choose a number for their group. So I'm going to write that out. So you can write this out in your own words, but I'll give you, a, this is an example of a good design so I'm going to mix equally sized papers, and that's another thing that is good. Um, sorry, I'm going to mix 60 equally sized papers in a hat, and label 20 each, one, two, and three. Then we're going to have each child chooses a number. 
and that's going to be their group. So then um, each after that, each group either watches a program or draws. And then the last thing I'm going to mention is that we're going to compare their mental ability and impulse control after this is over. So you can see um, that this is kind of the same idea as what I, what I drew out. That's just another way to look at it.